Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so I'm pleased to talk about uh, one of my favorite bacteria at the Clinical Virology Symposium. Um, but we're getting a lot of that, right? We're getting a lot of uh, uh, other information on other things other than viruses at this meeting. So I um, want to take you through, um, first of all, here's my uh, disclosures. Um, first, I want to talk just a little bit about the epidemiology of Bordetella infections in the United States. And then we'll um, get into a little bit about the, the test methods, um, uh, specifically for pertussis and parapertussis and some of the um, potential pitfalls and challenges with, uh, with those test methods. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, how important uh, these diagnoses are from a public health and infection control standpoint. So um, when we're thinking about pertussis, we're, we're talking most commonly about the organism Bordetella pertussis, which is a fairly fastidious, um, aerobic, slow-growing organism. Usually we have to use special culture media um, in the laboratory, such as Reagan Lowe or Bordet Jean Joux, um, to isolate this organism that can take, you know, three, four, five, six days before we actually see colonies. Uh, when we do, um, we'll see that this is an oxidase positive uh, gram negative rod. And, and pertussis um, specifically is important. It does produce multiple um, antigenic and biologically active products that contribute to its um, pathobiology um, in, in causing uh, whooping cough or pertussis disease. So it has um, particular um, uh, products like pertussis toxin, filamentous hemagglutinin, adenylate cyclase, pertactin, and tracheal cytotoxin that contribute to, the, to this path pathogenesis. And it is uh, extremely contagious um, bacterial infection um, found only in humans when we're talking about pertussis specifically. It, it has a very high secondary attack rate, um, upwards of um, 80 percent among close susceptible um, contacts. And it's spread very easily via aerosolized droplets from coughing or sneezing. And because it is found only in humans, um, the main reservoir for pertussis are um, individuals that have um, uh, been infected, they've not been treated, they're often mildly symptomatic or, or perhaps asymptomatic. And we see this, this kind of um, atypical presentation often in older um, adolescents and adults um, which serve, who serve as reservoirs for infection in some of the more vulnerable populations uh, like young infants. So immunity, whether it's from natural infection or from vaccination, um, really is not considered lifelong. So it, it does wane over time, and we'll get into a little bit more um, about that and how uh, some of that may be contributing to the increase in the number of cases that we've seen um, in the last uh, decade or so. So <clears throat> it does affect um, all age groups, um, but as I said, young infants are the most vulnerable. If, if they've been um, unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated, um, they are the ones that um, can succumb to the more serious um, infections due to pertussis. The incubation period after infection is uh, usually about 10 days, but it can be as long as 21 days. And the typical symptoms that we think of for uh, pertussis start with uh, Pariza, usually no pharyngitis. Um, if there is a fever, it may be just low grade. Or, um, you know, there, often there is no fever. And then um, that progresses into the paroxysmal coughing stage, which can be accompanied by um, post-tussive hemesis, the whoop, the post-tussive whoop. Generally, um, um, it does not cause a systemic illness. And as I said, you know, while these are the kind of classic symptoms that we see and they, they manifest more often in the younger um, infants and children, um, sometimes in older kids and adults, uh, this might present as something similar to the symptoms of a common cold uh, with nonspecific cough. Um, and it really can be often clinically indistinguishable from, from other respiratory illnesses in those older age groups. <clears throat> 
So this just kind of depicts that um, timeline of the course of infection. Um, pertussis um, is from the Latin, which means um, intense cough. And if uh, anybody has been around a, a, a young child or infant with um, uh, pertussis, it's uh, quite striking, very intense cough. So um, after the incubation period, um, the first stage uh, of the um, symptomatic illness is the catarrhal stage, which can, which can last uh, one or two weeks. This is where their cough might just begin to start, coryza, perhaps low-grade fever, um, and then the paroxysmal stage, which can last several weeks. And this is where the severe coughing starts. Um, this is where um, we hear the whoop um, after, the parox after the coughing. <clears throat> and that, that stage can go on for several weeks. And then finally, um, the convalescent stage, um, where um, coughing will continue often, particularly in young infants and children, for quite some time, but it will gradually decrease um, over time. So um, in infants, um, as I said, this is where we see the most um, serious and potentially life-threatening complications, um, particularly if they have not had any um, uh, vaccine. Um, we know that the young ones, less than 12 months of age, um, a lot of those infants, over half of those infants with pertussis will be hospitalized. The majority will have apnea. Um, about 23% will get pneumonia. A smaller percent will have seizures, and the, the mortality rate um, um, is about 1%, and some will also develop um, encephalopathy, probably related to the hypoxia from, from coughing. So this, this is what we're trying to prevent um, with vaccination, with testing and recognition of pertussis. And what about the other Bordetella species? There are um, several other species that um, can infect humans um, and perhaps cause a pertussis-like illness. And in fact, paraprotussis, Bordetella paraprotussis, has been shown to cause um, upwards of about 20% of pertussis-like illness or whooping cough. So it can very closely mimic um, the symptoms of, of pertussis. It does have pertussis toxin, but it is not expressed um, in parapertussis. The vaccine for pertussis um, does not have cross-reactivity for parapertussis, but um, very often if the diagnosis of pertussis is made, or parapertussis is made, um, treatment is indicated, especially for infants um, and household uh, contacts of infants and immune-compromised patients. Uh, Bordetella homesii um, is still, I think, an evolving story. Um, there are uh, reports from different parts of the world that Bordetella homesii may cause a small percentage of pertussis-like illness. Um, and it can often be misidentified as pertussis uh, based on PCR, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we talk about the test laboratory test methods. Again, the vaccine is not cross-protectional um, for Bordetella homesii. And in terms of treatment, it's not clear, but for the most part, um, all of the Bordetella species um, can be um, treated by the same macrolide antibiotic um, that's used for uh, most pertussis and paraprotussis infections. There are historically some case reports of Bordetella homesii causing uh, bacteremia, meningitis, and septic arthritis, but those are, are quite rare. And then finally, Bordetella bronchoseptica um, is mainly a respiratory pathogen in mammals like dogs and pigs, um, but it can occasionally or rarely be found in humans. Um, when it is, it's usually um, in, in uh, individuals with underlying risk factors like older age, immunodeficiency, or pre-existing lung conditions. But it can cause some um, chronic uh, respiratory symptoms, um, but it can also remain asymptomatic. So um, the role for Bordetella bronchoseptica is, is um, probably very minor um, overall when we're talking about Bordetella infections. So um, for the most part, I think, um, along with Bordetella pertussis, um, it's probably clinically relevant to be able to also identify Bordetella paraprotussis at this point in terms of um, 
from a laboratory standpoint in terms of detection and differentiation. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the, those laboratory methods. Uh, just briefly want to review kind of the last 100 years or so of, of pertussis very quickly in just a couple of slides. But this was a very significant pathogen um, back in the early 1900s um, where they did see about 10% uh, of individuals that were infected um, um, did die from infection. In 1922, it was made a notifiable national um, condition. And by 1934, we saw the peak of reported cases, um, over 260,000 cases of pertussis that year. And it wasn't until 1940 that the whole cell um, pertussis vaccine was developed. And then in 1943, the American Academy of Pediatrics formally recommended um, that uh, infants and children uh, receive um, the pertussis vaccine as part of the, uh, along with diphtheria and tetanus. And so for many decades after vaccination started, we saw a gradual decline in the number of annual cases uh, until uh, we hit the nadir in 1976 with only about 1,000 cases of, of pertussis reported. And then a couple decades later in the 1990s, we introduced the acellular pertussis vaccine, um, replacing the whole cell vaccine. And shortly thereafter, in the early 2000s, we noticed there was an emergence of pertussis illness um, among children and adolescents, most of whom who had been vaccinated. So in 2005, 2006, um, there was a recommendation in the United States um, to um, give a booster vaccine using the Tdap, uh, big tetanus, little diphtheria, little acellular pertussis, around age 11 or 12 to kind of boost um, immunity um, to pertussis. Um, the uptake for that uh, vaccine was, was very low and very slow. Um, I think the rates are still um, very, very low for Tdap um, administration uh, nationwide. And, and subsequently in later years in 2012, uh, we saw about 48,000 cases of pertussis um, that continued to stay high for several years. And then more recently, we're still seeing fairly high numbers of pertussis being reported in the United States, around 20,000 cases per year. And so you can uh, see that here um, in the graph dating back to the um, early 1900s, uh, where we saw our peak uh, Incidents in uh, the 1930s, that 265,000 cases, and then with the introduction of the diphtheria tetanus whole cell pertussis vaccine in um, 1940, the number of cases started to decline. And then in the 1990s, the um, acellular pertussis vaccine was introduced. And since that time, we've seen um, an increase, a gradual increase in the number of, of reported pertussis cases. And as I said, um, the infants are the ones that are at highest risk um, for severe complications due to influenza, or I'm sorry, to pertussis, got influenza virus on the brain. Um, and this graph just shows that um, they have the highest um, incidence uh, of infection um, over this time span. And we're also seeing an increase in incidence in the older children, school-aged children and um, adolescents um, as well. So we have this vaccine. We have a recommended um, vaccine schedule for pertussis, um, which is two, four, uh, it's a five dose vaccine, two, four, and six months. Again, a fourth dose at 15, 18 months, and then the fifth dose at um, four to six years at school, at, uh, school entry age. And then the Tdap um, is recommended again, um, around 11 or 12 years of age, in, and as well as into adulthood. So um, in terms of coverage in the United States uh, for the vaccine, um, some of the most recent numbers we have available um, back in 2009 to 2013 show that, it, that most individuals have gotten at least three doses. So around 94, 95% have gotten at least three doses of pertussis vaccine. Um, a slightly smaller number have, have gotten uh, four or more doses of vaccine. And those vaccines um, that are used, whether it's uh, uh, DTAP or Tdap, 
Um, there are a couple of different formulations for each of those. Um, and you can see the um, antigenic composition here very slightly um, among the different um, uh, vaccines um, in terms of the micrograms per dose and the, and the actual number of antigens that are included um, in each of those. So um, despite all of our efforts with uh, vaccination, we have, as I said, seen a, a, a somewhat of a resurgence of pertussis in the last um, 10 or 15 years or so. And so there's a lot of questions about why, why this is uh, occurring. Um, and so there's some explanations that, or some thoughts that perhaps the adaptive immunity following immunization um, is, is somewhat short-lived. So we're seeing uh, more uh, waning immunity um, after the primary vaccination series. There's some thought about the effect effectiveness of the acellular vaccines, particularly compared to the whole cell vaccine, because both of those can um, um, reduce the disease severity um, of infection, but they don't necessarily um, reduce transmission. So we have seen a number of outbreaks of pertussis <clears throat> over the last 10 years or so in which a lot of uh, those individuals were vaccinated um, with most, if not all, of the doses of the vaccine. The vaccines are also not cross-protective, as I said, for Bordetella paraprotussis and Bordetella holmesii. So some of the pertussis-like illness or whooping cough that we might that we might be seeing could be due to um, these other Bordetella species, perhaps. And then we do have a, a, a smaller percentage, fortunately, of, of individuals who are actually completely unvaccinated. So all of these could be kind of contributing to our recognition of uh, increasing uh, resurgence of pertussis-like illness here in the United States um, in the past few years. So in terms of adaptive immunity, there is a little bit of difference between um, the, the immune response in, from, ACE, from the acellular vaccine versus whole cell vaccine or natural infection. So um, response to the acellular vaccine is more of a mixed T helper one, T helper two type of response. Whereas for whole cell vaccine or natural infection, it's mostly a Th1 type response. And so, um, it also could be that some of the some of the antigens that are um, in the vaccine may not be sufficient um, to make make it as efficacious as possible, or it could be that some of the concentrations of the antigens in the vaccines are not necessarily appropriate. Um, one of the uh, other ideas is that um, um, the strains of the more recent strains of pertussis are actually um, changing over time, and so the antigenic composition of the vaccine is not necessarily matching the more currently circulating strains. And there's some, some good work on, on this. A uh, number of, of uh, labs have shown some of these differences uh, of the current strains versus the older vaccine strains. Okay, so let's talk about testing for Bordetella infection. So, both the WHO and the CDC um, provide recommendations on diagnostic testing, which is really dependent on the, um, the timing of the onset of symptoms um, in patients with pertussis and how they're presenting. So um, generally speaking, if the patient has had a cough illness for less than about two weeks, um, they would recommend doing both culture and uh, PCR for those patients. If the cough illness is between uh, two and three weeks um, post onset, um, then PCR is, is more reliable during that time period. And then if the cough illness is uh, beyond three weeks um, from onset, then um, there is perhaps some role for serology um, in those patients. So we'll talk a little bit about um, each of those methods. Um, so again, at the top here, we see the kind of the timeline of uh, infection. That first couple weeks during the catarrhal stage, um, the, the patient is um, highly infectious at that point, And there's uh, typically uh, a lot of uh, bacterial burden 
in the nasopharynx, in the upper respiratory tract. And so um, certainly um, the more bug that's there, the more reliable things like culture will be as well as uh, PCR. Um, PCR is also uh, reliable um, beyond the first couple of weeks and then later serology, as I mentioned. So culture, um, we know, is advantageous because it has essentially 100% specificity. If we isolate pertussis in culture, um, that's uh, essentially 100% positive predictive value. Um, the issue that we've seen over the years now that we have molecular methods available is that culture is actually fairly insensitive um, for detection of Bordetella um, and pertussis specifically. And the turnaround time is also, as I said, it takes several days um, for the organism to grow. So um, by the time we actually confirm it, um, that patient may have, if they've been untreated, they may have gone on to infect uh, another, uh, another, uh, a lot of other individuals as well. So PCR, um, uh, as I said, is very uh, sensitive, much more sensitive than culture. It can be done um, fairly rapidly. Um, there are questions about using such a sensitive method and whether or not we may actually be occasionally, in some cases, looking at false positive results. Um, we know that uh, the, the vaccine, for example, um, the acellular pertussis vaccine um, has pertussis DNA in the vaccine. So we've seen um, pseudo outbreaks um, in locations where they've given the vaccine in the same room where they've collected the upper respiratory tract specimens for PCR um, due to contamination from the vaccine in those specimens. Um, we'll also talk about um, the different PCR tar targets briefly um, because uh, depending on the type of PCR that we're using, it may not necessarily be 100% specific for pertussis. There may be some cross-reactivity with other Bordetella species. And then serology um, can be somewhat sensitive and specific for diagnosing pertussis infection, but that's often uh, more of a retrospective diagnosis, particularly if we need to collect acute and convalescent sera. Um, as far as I know, there are no FDA-cleared um, serologic assays for pertussis. Um, and the, the interpretation um, often can be confounded um, depending on the vaccination status of the patient as well. So let's focus on uh, uh, PCR. This is an example of a pertussis um, assay uh, that we used many years ago that was uh, targeting the IS-481 sequence, the insertion sequence 481, which is a nice target because it has multiple copies per genome, upwards of sometimes greater than 200 copies of this particular sequence within um, the pertussis genome. In this particular assay, um, we designed uh, 114 base pair amplicon. But the issue is that this particular sequence that we're using, um, as you can see from the alignment below, was 100% identical with the um, insertion sequence that's in Bordetella holmesiae. So um, it would cross-react, potentially, um, if Bordetella holmesiae was in that upper respiratory tract specimen. So we need to think about the targets. Um, a lot of the assays um, that have, people have developed over the years have um, focused on um, insertion sequence targets. And um, shown here are the more um, relevant Bordetella species and some of the potential crop for cross-reactivity among insertion sequences. So as I said, IS-481 <clears throat> can be found in fairly high copy number um, in pertussis, a lower copy number in Bordetella homesii, so maybe only eight or 10 copies per genome in Bordetella homesii, and rarely is it found in, in Bordetella bronchoseptica. Um, the IS insertion sequence 1001, we generally use for Bordetella pertussis, paraportussis, excuse me, um, but there have been rare um, descriptions of, of this uh, particular sequence in uh, Bordetella bronchoseptica. Some people have developed uh, what they call a Holmesii, Holmesii specific um, insertion sequence 1001 assay, um, which is specific for Bordetella Holmesii. Um, and then IS-102 is, is uh, in, uncommonly uh, used, but there are 
are multiple species that harbor that insertion sequence. And then, uh, there, so, there, so that, that insertion, use of the insertion sequences can lead to some uh, questions about the specificity and, and occasionally. Um, so some have uh, looked at single copy um, gene targets for pertussis um, in, the, around, in and around the pertussis toxin. So the pertussis toxin pro promoter region or uh, uh, toxin subunit 1A um, to try to get greater specificity. Um, but there can still be cross-reactivity with some of these targets as well. Uh, we know it's in pertussis, but parapertussis also um, has the pertussis toxin, although it's not expressed. And bronchoseptica, some strains of bronchoseptica will also have the pertussis toxin, but, the, but it's not expressed. They don't have um, a functional, uh, there's not a functional um, um, inducer or uh, regulator of that toxin. So another way to perhaps look at this um, in molecular assays would be to uh, do a, a mouth analysis or multiplex of the different targets to try to determine exactly which Bordetella species um, is detected. So the CDC has uh, come up with uh, this type of multi-target approach um, where they can um, detect and then differentiate um, um, pertussis, parapertussis, and uh, Holmesii using a variety of different um, target sequences. Um, but remember, um, some of these targets like the pertussis toxin are single copy, um, single copy per genome targets, whereas the IS-481 is 100, 200 copies per genome. So um, using that target, we have much greater sensitivity. Um, and so in some cases, if we have high CTs for IS-481, since the pertussis, pertussis, or pertussis toxin target is a single copy, um, we may not be able to detect that reliably. And then um, I don't want to leave out culture altogether. I think there is still some role for, for culture in certain instances, particularly if there is a, an ongoing outbreak or an outbreak is suspected. Um, as I said, isolation of pertussis and culture um, is 100% um, specific. Um, culture can also um, potentially identify, if it's not pertussis, some um, other pathogens with similar clinical presentations, other Bordetella species. Um, and it's nice to have these isolates uh, for further characterization for susceptibility testing. If someone has, uh, has failed macrolide therapy, um, it would be important to actually have the isolate. And with regard to testing, particularly in the young infants, we've, we've seen this, uh, especially with PCR, but these, these uh, unvaccinated or undervaccinated infants um, are going to still harbor pertussis or pertussis DNA for an extended period of time, even after they've been diagnosed and been started on treatment. Um, this is an old study from the 90s, but they demonstrated that in this age group, um, after treatment was started, you could still detect the organism uh, from an upper respiratory tract specimen culture for up to about a week after uh, antibiotics have been started. And with P by PCR, you can detect um, the organ organism um, after the start of therapy uh, for quite some time. In this study, it was up to about two weeks, but I've seen uh, young infants, newborns, uh, pertussis positive for um, over a month. Okay, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about um, um, how we do um, Bordetella testing um, at our facility. I'm from Texas Children's. Uh, we're about a 650-bed tertiary care teaching hospital. A lot of admissions every year, a lot of uh, emergency room visits. Uh, many of those uh, are for respiratory tract infections, and some of those turn out to be pertussis or, or parapertussis. Um, our current assay for uh, Bordetella is a lab-developed test. It's a homebrew um, multiplex for detection of uh, and differentiation of pertussis and parapertussis. And we utilize the, um, the IS-481 target for Bordetella pertussis and the IS-1001 target for uh, parapertussis. And we've um, streamlined all of our collection protocols for, for this particular assay so that all the samples 
are uh, all the nasopharyngeal samples are collected on um, swabs and put into the e-swab transport system, which has, um, as many of you know, it has a, a one mil of Amy's buffer in that tube. So we elude all the sample off of the, the swab. We take 200 microliters uh, from that uh, buffer and we do an extraction um, on the EZ1 advanced Excel platform. We make our master mix, right? We've got to get all of our primers and probes and enzymes together, um, make a master mix, and then that goes on to the LightCycler uh, 2.0. And so this testing, um, high complexity, right? It's high complexity. Um, we do this batched um, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, the, whole, the total uh, processing uh, to reporting time um, usually takes about three hours. And just throw in, I threw in some numbers of our positivity rates from, um, from last year. So about 12% of, of all the samples that were submitted for pertussis, paraprotussis PCR um, were um, identified as Bordetella pertussis. And then uh, about 0.5%, um, very a much smaller number, um, were um, identified as Bordetella paraprotussis. So that turns out to be, I think, if I did my math correct, about 4% um, about of our pertussis-like illness um, could be attributable to Bordetella paraprotussis. Remember I said it could be up to, in some studies, as high as 20% of pertussis-like illness can be due, due to paraprotussis. Last year for us, it was about 4, five, four to 5%. Okay, and you've heard from uh, Michelle uh, about the... Uh, the Asorin platform, the Bordetella Direct Kit specifically, um, does de detect and differentiate pertussis and parapertussis um, using the IS481 target for pertussis and the IS1001 target for parapertussis. And it uses, utilizes the eight well um, direct amplification disc that Michelle described. And in this particular assay, we take uh, 50 microliters um, from the wh whichever buffer the nasopharyngeal swab is uh, uh, transported in, add the, um, the reagent for the assay at the same time, and then the, the disc goes on to the uh, liaison MDX, and the runtime is about 60 minutes. And so we have the eight well disc, so we can run up to, uh, up to eight um, at a time. If we only want run one or two, um, we can still utilize the remainder of the, of the disc at a later time. And as Michelle said, this is uh, moderately complex. So it was good to see also that, um, that Dia Soren made sure to include all of these different uh, transport types, uh, collection devices um, into the FDA clearance. So all of the REML media, the UTM, um, the UVT, um, as, and then as well um, the, the eSwab transport system. So um, the test can be done from nasopharyngeal swabs in, in a variety of, of these transport systems. Um, it can be kept cold up to seven days uh, for testing or, or at minus 70 beyond that. And then um, kind of gone through the, the workflow, workflow just a little bit, but um, it's very straightforward, just adding the sample, adding the reagent, no off-board extraction that's, that's necessary. And as Michelle said, there's a liquid sensor to make sure that the sample was added um, appropriately, and it could be done very quickly. So uh, last year, uh, we undertook a study to look at uh, the comparison between our LDT assay for pertussis and paraprotussis compared to the Simplexa Bordetella Direct. We looked um, at uh, clinical sensitivity and specificity, a little bit of work on analytical sensitivity and specificity, as well as uh, reproducibility. So we had um, 91 um, NP swabs that were uh, in e-swabs, transport systems. Um, 50 of those were pertussis positive by our LDT, and um, 11 of those uh, were paraprotussis positive by our LDT. So I'll fast forward um, to our uh, clinical data, um, clinical sensitivity and specificity. So on the top, you can see the, um, 
the results of the simplex of Bordetella Direct, and then on the left-hand side, the, the, the results of our LDT. So we had, as I said, 50 positive um, pertussis by the LDT. Um, the Bordetella Direct um, detected 49 of those for a sensitivity of 98%. And that one particular sample had um, relatively high CT um, on our light cycler assay. Um, it was right around uh, 30. And then of the uh, 11 um, paraprotestis positive by our assay, um, all were correctly uh, positive by the Portatella direct assay. So overall, um, for, for both the targets and the, and the negative samples, the overall agreement um, with our LDT was about 99%. Then we just did a little bit of work looking at um, uh, analytical um, sensitivity. Basically, we extracted a couple of the type strains, one for pertussis, one for paraprotussis, and uh, measured the, the concentration of uh, DNA in those samples, and then just did some serial dilutions based on the concentration of DNA. So you can see that um, the, for Bordetella pertussis, um, the, um, the, our laboratory developed test was uh, about around a log, perhaps more, more sensitive than the Bordetella direct assay. Um, and then in the paraprotestis uh, dilution series, um, it was perhaps a little bit less than a log fold um, difference in terms of uh, sensitivity. But again, with our lab developed assay, we're doing 200 microliters, off board extraction, making a master mix, putting on the light cycler. Um, so, and interestingly, when I looked at the package insert um, in terms of CFU per ml, uh, remember that the pertussis target is the IS481, which is, uh, can be over 200 copies per genome, whereas the Bordetella paraprotussis target, the IS1001, um, has only maybe um, 15 to 20 copies per genome. So we do see about a log fold um, difference in, in sensitivity in terms of CFU per ml between pertussis and paraprotussis, and that's likely due just to the number of, of targets per genome. And that seemed to correspond um, very similarly with the, the data, the, the little bit of testing that we did in terms of analytical sensitivity. The paraprotussis um, was about a log full um, different in terms of sensitivity than the pertussis with both assays. So overall, um, in our evaluation, uh, the Simplexa assay, as I've described, is, has much fewer steps, less hands-on time, um, really, uh, I think, reduces the potential for errors, especially when we're doing extractions off-board and master mix preparations. And there's uh, um, much lower risk of cross-contamination. And so we could run eight samples uh, with this workflow very quickly in um, just over an hour versus, as I said, about three hours with our laboratory developed test. And we can eliminate the um, off-board extraction and actually have the flexibility to um, perform the Bordetella test now um, every day instead of just three times a week batching. We can run this perhaps uh, multiple times per day as the samples come in, onesies, twosies, um, and run them and get the answer um, in an hour. So just to summarize, uh, uh, I think I've impressed upon you that pertussis is a highly contagious infection. Uh, we have seen it reemerge in recent years and it's, and it's continuing to have, we're continuing to have high uh, numbers of cases on an annual basis. And it's not clear exactly why we're seeing this resurgence in, in disease. It could be multifactorial, waning immunity, changes in vaccine efficacy or changes in the, um, the genome of the circulating strains or the antigenic characterization of the current strains. And so we do know, uh, have known that the diagnosis is uh, most, uh, um, most often best accomplished by PCR um, to detect um, the common treatable pertussis causing um, uh, infections. Uh, and we can see that illness more, mo mostly with pertussis and paraprotussis. And then I really didn't get into the uh, infection control or public health interventions, but of course you can, you can um, guess that the quicker we can make this diagnosis, the quicker those um, patients can get on treatment, 
um, the less likely they are to transmit the infection as well as to have um, a lower symptomatic burden um, themselves. So I uh, appreciate your time and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Nice talk, thank you. <clears throat> I have one question. Uh, because there are some FDA approved assay that targets pertussis toxin, and of course there are other assays that uh, targets IS-481, and because of the copy number, the IS-481 will be more sensitive than pertussis toxin, but one can argue that since it is more specific, the specificity will be higher for PTX toxin versus IS-481. I just want to seek your opinion. You, you have any thought on that? Yeah, so you're correct that the, so the, the single target copy, um, like for pertussis, pertussis toxin promoter, is, uh, is gonna be more specific for Bordetella pertussis compared to IS-481. Um, but remember, you're, you're, you're increasing your sensitivity because uh, with the IS-481 by um, more than two logs, just because there's higher copy number um, of that target than there is of the pertussis toxin promoter. So, um, but, that, but you have to deal with that issue of potential cross-reactivity with Bordetella holmesii, right? Um, less so with Bordetella bronchoseptica. But as I said, um, all of those organisms can cause this pertussis-like illness. And so from a patient standpoint, I think since they all can be treated with the same macrolide um, therapy, that whether or not we know specifically that it's pertussis versus Holmesii, I think it's, it's safer um, to, um, to go ahead and treat it and call it pertussis um, rather than not and rather than um, lose that sensitivity by sticking to a, a single uh, target copy um, for PCR. That's just my opinion. Hi, thank you for your talk. I did enjoy it. I just had a quick question. Um, I know you concluded that the you found you, you believe that carryover was less likely. Is that something that you officially examined in a carryover study? No, so we haven't done that to, to a large extent. Um, um, I mean, we have done some where we do alternating wells with a few positives and a few negatives and things like that, um, but not to a significant extent, no. Okay, thank you. But we have not seen it any, in the little bit that we did, we have not seen any carryover sure. or cross-contamination. Hi, Jim. Uh, thanks for the uh, thorough uh, review of the um, test and also the disease. So simple question. Did I understand it right that <clears throat> there's a two log uh, difference in acid sensitivity compared to the um, laboratory developed acid? Compared to what? I'm sorry. LD, LDT. Yeah, so it, we, we didn't, you know, we didn't do a probate analysis. We didn't do extensive um, LOD determinations, but just doing a few reactions at the different serial concentrations of the, the DNA. Um, for pertussis, it looked like it was maybe just over a log difference um, between our LDT and the Simplexa Direct. Um, and the parapertussis was, it was, the LDT was three out of three and the, and the parapertussis and the Simplexa was one out of three at the same concentration. So slight difference in sensitivity, just analytically speaking. Thank yeah. you. Great. So we'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs>